Hello and welcome to another episode of Saga Stories from the Reykjavik Grapevine. My name is Dr. Matthew Roby from the University of Iceland uh, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most famous of all of the Eastlendinga Sögur, that is uh, Njál's Saga. Njál saga was written in the late 13th century um, and is first attested in manuscripts from around the turn of the 14th century. Um, and it is also uh, the longest of all of the Eastlendinger Sögur, uh, hailed especially for its intricate weaving of narrative threads throughout the saga. Uh, in fact, people who are reading sagas for the first time, one of the common problems that they have is uh, understanding exactly why things happen later in the saga, which are actually set up in events, sometimes seemingly insignificant events, and relationships that are established much earlier. And Njál's saga is a prime example of that. Um, it shows how feud violence develops according to a sort of a snowball effect. Lots of seemingly small events building up and triggering an avalanche of violence. Njál saga therefore shows the tragic and self-perpetuating nature of feud violence, which, if the sagas are to be believed, continue to plague Iceland throughout the Commonwealth period. Um, but Njál saga also shows how the law can be used as a guard against this self-perpetuating feud violence. It contains some episodes that show the success of law in preventing feud, and a few episodes that show the tragic uh, lack of success uh, of, of the law at, at stopping feud violence. And we begin the story of Njál saga here at Hlíðarendi, which was the farmstead of one of the heroes in the early part of Njál saga, whose name is Gunnar. He's known as Gunnar á Hlíðarendi, or Gunnar of Hlíðarendi. Gunnar is a handsome, brave hero and a great fighter. Uh, and like many heroes in the Eastlendinger Sögur, he goes off as a young man to a trip uh, to Scandinavia, where he wins renown doing various uh, deeds uh, and acts. And then he comes back to Iceland um, and then goes to the Althing where he meets his future wife, Hattlgerður, who is known as one of the best matches in Iceland at the time, uh, well known for her long legs and beautiful hair. Now, Gunnar uh, gets engaged to Hattlgerður at the All Thing, uh, despite receiving uh, advice against it from a number of people, uh, including from her uncle, who warns him of uh, Hattlgerður's bad temperament. Um, but they do get married, uh, and uh, Hattlgerður and Gunnar return to Hlíðarendi to live. Um, now, a few years after they get married, there is a particularly bad winter and lots of people are running out of supplies. But Gunnar, as a consummate hero, very generous, uh, gives to all of the farmers who come to ask for supplies who are running short. And because of that, Gunnar himself runs low on supplies. Uh, so he rides to the house of a neighbour called Otket and asks whether he can have some of his supplies to survive the winter. Uh, and despite the generosity that Gunnar has shown, uh, Otket refuses. He refuses to sell or give uh, any of his uh, winter supplies to Gunnar. Uh, one of the people who's with Gunnar suggests that uh, they just take what they need by force and if they really want to they can leave the, the fair payment for it. But Gunnar refuses. He says, I, I will not be a thief. Now, one of Gunnar's good friends is Njálk, who, as the name of the saga suggests, is another of the saga's main characters. Um, Njálk is a, a wise man, very skilled in law, and a great peacemaker. And he's a good friend of Gunnar, and he hears about this refusal to give supplies, and he provides Gunnar with ample supplies to survive the winter. Now, the following summer, when both Gunnar and Njálk are at the thing, Hattlgerður tells one of her slaves to go and steal provisions from Otkettl's farm. 
Now obviously there's a great difference between the situation that they were in in the winter and this situation in the summer. During the winter everyone is struggling to have enough food and so the transactions of supplies show the great benevolence of people like Gunnar and Njautl and the great stinginess um, of people like Othketl. But of course now it's, uh, it's high summer, everyone has enough to eat, but Hatlgerda sends this slave to steal from Othketl just out of spite, just out of revenge. And she tells him to steal butter and cheese and burn down the storehouse so that the crime will be covered up. Um, when Gunnar returns from the thing, he's served cheese at his house at Leatherendi, um, but he is suspicious about it because he knows that he didn't have any cheese and he asks her where she got it from. She replies in a coy way, but in a way that makes it clear that she has not only stolen the cheese, but is also very proud of having done so. And at that point, Gunnar does a very famous thing. He slaps her in the face um, and says, I refuse to be married to a thief. Um, although they do stay married, of course. But Hatlgerda then says, I will remember this slap and I will avenge it if I can. Now we fast forward a little bit. Gunnar is involved in a series of feuds, um, including one feud that arises from this theft of cheese and another feud that arises from a row at a horse fight. Um, and during these feuds, Gunnar kills a great deal of men in self-defense, often when he's ambushed by many men. Um, but with Njautl's help, remember he's a great lawyer, uh, Gunnar is able to escape the legal consequences of most of these killings. Until finally, he ends up being sentenced to, at the Althing to lesser outlawry. This means um, that the person who has been made a lesser outlaw has to leave Iceland, if they can, for three full years. Um, and if they are found in Iceland, not trying to leave, they can be killed with impunity during that three-year period. Um, so Gunnar and his, his brother Kolskegger are both sentenced to lesser outlawry at the Thing. Um, and they're getting ready to leave, to sail out from Iceland, uh, from the bay here at the Markarfljót River. Uh, and so Gunnar and Kolskega get on their horses here at Líðarendi and ride towards the shore. Now before Gunnar reaches uh, the Markarfljót River, his horse happens to stumble. Uh, and it, Gunnar is unseated, he's thrown off his horse and he ends up uh, falling down but facing his farmstead. Um, and he is uh, captivated by the beauty that he sees in front of him, of his own farmstead. Um, and he utters a very famous line. He says, Föger er hlýðin, svo at mér hefir hún aldrei japt föger sínst, bleikir akrar og sleginn tún, og mun ég ríðar heim aftur og fara kvergi which means, fair is the hillside, such that it might never have seemed so fair to me, pale fields and mown meadows. I will ride home again and travel nowhere. So at this point, because Gunnar is choosing to stay in Iceland despite being an outlaw, he's basically sentencing himself to death. He knows that people will be after him. Um, but Gunnar goes about his business as usual as if he hasn't been outlawed, uh, and then at the next all thing, the next summer, he's sentenced to full outlawry. Now Gunnar's enemies, one of whom is named Murder Valgarðsson, uh, uh, who is a, a, a prosperous farmer in the region who is jealous of Gunnar's success, they plan an attack against him here at Líðarendi. And the attack goes like this. Uh, Gunnar has a dog, a guard dog, that was given to him by his brother-in-law, Olaver Paui, whom we spoke about in our video at Thingvetlir. Uh, he's given him this guard dog called Saumur, which is a dog that is both clever and strong. And people think that Gunnar cannot be defeated while Saumur lives, because he will always alert Gunnar to danger. So they begin by trying to lure the dog away, but the dog sees that the people are armed and ready for battle. He can tell that there's going to be an attack, and he starts barking and attacking them. One of the attackers kills Saumur, and he lets out an enormous howl that Gunnar hears from his house, and therefore knows that his death is coming. Then, 
They send one man to the farmstead to see whether Gunnar is home, and he tries to look through one of the windows to see, but Gunnar is ready with his halberd, that's a, a big pole axe. Uh, he sticks it through the window and kills this attacker. Well, he, st he sticks it through the window and pierces the attacker, and before the attacker dies, he returns to the group, and they say, well, was Gunnar home? And the attacker says, I don't know whether Gunnar is home, but his halberd certainly is. So then they launch several attacks on the farmstead, but they keep being beaten back because Gunnar has his bow and arrow and he keeps uh, shooting from afar so they can't get close. Um, at this point, Murder, the jealous farmer, suggests that they burn him inside his farm, but the other attackers don't think that's a good thing because it's shameful to burn such a hero in his farm and not fight him properly uh, and honourably. So Murther comes up with a, an idea to attach ropes to the roof of the farm and then twist them around poles to, to drag the roof off the farmstead, which they then proceed to do. So now Gunnar is inside his house, but the house is roofless, and one of the attackers manages to get in and cut his bowstring. So now he can no longer shoot at them from afar and they might be able to launch a successful attack. It's at that moment that Gunnar turns to Hattlegerther, his wife, and asks her, could you give me two locks of your hair so that you and my mother can uh, twist them into a bowstring and I can restring the bow and keep defending myself? Hattlegerther says, what depends on it? Gunnar says, my life depends on it. And she then reminds him of the slap that he gave her earlier in the saga um, and refuses to give him this hair. So now... Gunnar is defenceless um, and the, the attackers manage to surround, overpower and kill him. Um, during this last stand, Gunnar manages to kill two of his attackers and wound 16 of them. And even the attackers admit that this was an incredibly stout defence, an incredibly brave last stand and one that will be remembered for as long as Iceland is inhabited. So we've come a few kilometres south of Hlitherendi to the uh, shores of the Markarfljot River leading southwards toward the sea. Um, and it is here where the scene of one of the most epic battle scenes of Njal Saga takes place. Around the time of Gunnar's death, a number of characters make trips to Norway, among them uh, some of Njal's sons and also Thrawin Sigfusson, who is a relative of Hatlgerder and Gunnar by marriage. Um, and while in Norway, while in Norway, uh, Thrawin helps a very malicious man uh, named Rapper escape from uh, Haukon Jarl, the ruler of Norway at the time. Uh, but it's actually the other Icelanders who are in Norway, the sons of Njalk, who are held accountable for this crime. Uh, they are attacked and in fact they are uh, imprisoned. Now when they return to Iceland, the sons of Njalk go to uh, where Thrawin is living to try and seek compensation for the shame that they experienced in Norway uh, on his behalf. But Thrawin and Hrappur and Hatlgerder are there at the house and they dismiss the claims of the Njalk sons and um, they, they even insult them. They insult their masculinity and send them away. So uh, a little while later, Njalk wakes up uh, at his home, Bergthorskvot, uh, to find his sons up and dressed for battle. And he asks them where they're going, and they say, we're going to hunt for sheep. But of course, that's not true. They have information from their mother that Thrawin is traveling with a small group of men uh, somewhere around here. He's heading, um, east, uh, he's heading westwards, uh, and, and they live just to the east. So they have dressed for battle, and they come here to the Markarfljot River uh, to do battle. Now, this also takes place in winter, so as it is now, the Markarfljot is partially frozen. There are large slabs of ice on each side, and apparently there are, there are even beautiful arcs of ice uh, going partially over the river. Um, and how the battle unfolds is that there are seven men in Thrawin's party, and they are on one of the, uh, one of the eastern banks, and the sons of Njautl are here on the, on the western shore. 
um, and they're preparing for battle when Skarpheddin, who is one of Njart's most fearsome sons, a very large man and a very strong man, he leaps over the river, landing on the sheet of ice that Thrawin and his men are on, and he jumps with such force that he, when he lands on the ice, he starts to slide, apparently as fast as if he was flying. He flies uh, on this ice, through Thrawin's party, so fast that nobody can hit him, and he manages with his large battle axe to hit Thrawin in the face, killing him and knocking his teeth onto the ice. So you can, you, you can see that it's a very epic, a very cinematic battle um, that takes place uh, and, and, and possibly threatens the whole peace of the region. So it's four o'clock and you can see that the sun is already setting here in Iceland, but we've arrived at the uh, third and final uh, location of our Njál Saga tour. This is the site of Bergthor's Kvot, which was the home of Bergthora, hence the name, who was the wife of Njál. It's where Njál, his wife and their sons lived uh, in the sagas. The saga is also called Brennu Njál Saga, which means the saga of burnt Njál, and that's because at this site, uh, attackers burned Njautl and his family inside their home um, in one of the tragic scenes of the saga. Um, and this scene arises in part because of the killing we just discussed. The killing of Thrau in Sigfusson on the Markarfliot River uh, threatened the peace of the entire district. Um, but Njaut manages to organise a legal settlement um, and in order to cement that settlement he also fosters Thrawin's son, Herskulder Thrawinson. And he loves Herskulder as much as any of his own sons um, and does a lot to improve his condition. He gets him a chieftainship and he also gets him a very eligible wife, Hildigunner. Um, now, Murder Valgarðsson, who you might remember was uh, the farmer who was jealous of Gunnar, he then becomes jealous of the success that Njáll's foster son, uh, Herskulder, is having. Um, and so, although, as I said, Thráin's death was settled legally, um, Murder uses the idea that there might be lingering enmity between the two sides, between the allies and relatives of Gunnar and the allies and relatives of Njáll. He uses the idea that there might be still lingering enmity there to drive a wedge between the sons of Njáll and Herskulder. In particular, he's able to use lies um, like that there is still this lingering enmity and other deceits to convince the sons of Njáll that Herskulder is against them. Um, and he manages to convince them to kill him in a, in a tragic scene while he's just sowing crops in his field. Um, and after the death of Herskulder, there are many people who mourn his death, but nobody more so than his foster father, Njáll. Now, they almost managed to achieve a legal settlement that might prevent further feud violence uh, after the death of Herskulder, but at the all thing, this unfortunately falls through at the last moment, in a very interesting scene, in fact. Um, and so then, the relatives of Herskulder are now bent on blood revenge, and they are led by Flossi, who is uh, the uncle of Herskulder's wife, Hildigunner. Um, so, after the settlement falls through, uh, various people here at Bergthor's Kvot have premonitions of disaster. Both Njáll and Bergthor can foresee uh, the deaths of their family and the destruction of their homestead, and uh, a woman who is living with them, Bergthora's former foster mother, who is still a pagan, even has uh, a prophecy that the uh, farm will be burned, um, and she even warns them about it. But this, all of the family of Njáll show uh, great fatalism in the face of all of these premonitions, because they do nothing to try and flee, they do nothing to try and avert uh, the, the coming disaster, they simply wait for it. Um, and on the night of the burning itself, this fatalism uh, continues to be shown to an even greater extent, arguably. Flossie and the rest of the burners arrive at Bergthor's Kvot, 
Um, and Nyautl and his sons come out of the house and it seems like there might be a battle between the two sides. And at that point, the burners are not quite sure how it's going to go. They're not even sure that they're going to win necessarily or that they're going to win very easily. But at that moment, Nyautl decides to order him, his whole family back inside the house, even though people have warned him that the house is going to be burned. Um, and uh, when he makes this order, his son Skarpevin even repeats that warning. He says, I don't think we should go inside because they're just going to burn us inside the house, but we're going to follow your advice anyway. So they go into the house and the burners light the fire. The house starts to set on fire uh, and Nyaut continues to show this fatalism, this unwillingness to do anything, to avert his fate. Um, because once the fire is lit, the burners offer various groups the chance to leave the house. Women, uh, children and servants. Um, and they call Nyaut to the door and they say, you and Bergthora can also come out because you had nothing to do with the death of Herskulder and you're both old. Um, but they both choose to stay in the house. Nyaut says that because I'm an old man, I don't want to live in the shame of not being able to avenge my sons after this burning. And Bergthora says, uh, I was given to Nyaut at a young age and I intend to die with him here. So they return to the house, um, even though it's on fire. Um, and in fact, they uh, have a sort of a saintly death. They take their equally innocent grandson to their bed. They cross themselves and surrender themselves to God, pull an ox hide over themselves and just wait to be consumed by the flames. Um, this, and, and then increasing the idea of this saintliness, once the burning has happened and they're going through the rubble to try and find bodies, they pull uh, this ox hide up and they find Nyaut and Bergthora and the grandson's body almost entirely uncorrupted, which in medieval texts is usually a sign of saintliness. Now, you might remember that when they were trying to kill Gunnar in his house, the idea of burning him in was called shameful. Murtha was trying to say, let's burn him in because these attacks aren't working. And the rest of the attackers said, no, that's shameful. And this was also believed of the attack at Bergthor's Kvotl as well. Even the attackers themselves, while they are burning in Nyautl and his family, they say, this is a wicked deed and it will be remembered as, as quite shameful. Um, and in fact, this is true. The rest of the saga uh, narrates how uh, one of the people who does manage to escape the burning, Kauri, Nyautl's brother, uh, now son-in-law, he managed to escape and he tracks down many of the burners, uh, killing them in vengeance for this wicked deed. Uh, and the saga ends ultimately with him making peace with the lead burner, Flossi, and marrying Herskulder's former wife, Hildigunnar. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting tale of the burning. Uh, it's very tragic, of course. It's one of the tragic climaxes of the saga. Um, and it shows how characters in the sagas, in particular in this case, Nyautl and his wife, they surrender themselves to fate. Um, they're both Christians at this point, and so they could be surrendering themselves to a Christian fate. Like I said, their death is quite saintly. Um, but ultimately, this is something that is common to many saga characters, pre- and post-Christianization. They often accept their fate willingly, stoically, and that's part of the, uh, the, the ethos of the sagas. So that's it for today's episode on Nyaul Saga. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please remember to like, comment and subscribe below. Uh, and please look out for future saga stories from the Reykjavik grapevine in the future. My name is Dr. Matthew Roby from the University of Iceland and I'd like to thank you for watching. Bye bye.